go ahead and get started. Thank you for coming uh, to the second discussion session of Health and Homelessness for this quarter. I know we're competing with food next door uh, for the dental school, so thank you for bringing your lunches here and we're having it. So that's there. Um, so today, today we have Nancy Amade and she'll talk about advocacy, uh, advocating for homeless populations. But first I want to just talk for a few minutes um, kind of on a similar subject. So uh, the writing didn't come out. So tonight, uh, two teams of students uh, from this class will be doing the one night count, and I've, we've talked a lot about that, especially been in the course if you've been in the course since last year. But the idea with a one night count is that it'll capture uh, the scope of homelessness in our community, and we can see in one of the coldest evenings of the year how many people are still not able to find housing, whether it be temporary or in a shelter. Uh, they're also counting the people who are staying in shelter and uh, on buses as well. So tonight at 1.30 a.m. while you're fast asleep in bed, we'll be out there counting um, with about 900 other volunteers. And they usually provide results the next morning. So at, uh, I guess we don't have a class next week, but in two weeks I'll, I'll show you the results and how they've changed since the year before. If you, have any, if you want to learn more about it, you can go to uh, homelessinfo.org, which is the Seattle King County Coalition of Town Homelessness uh, website regarding the one night count. Uh, another way you can get involved beyond uh, volunteering at UGM or at 45th or going to uh, is to go to a lobby day, and that's kind of the point today. I know the dental school is closed, but if you're in a different discipline, uh, there are a lot of lobby days, and you're welcome to attend any of them and talk about issues that are all in your profession. Dental Action Day, as everyone knows, is January 31st, but if, if you'd like to attend any other, other lobby days, uh, feel free to. Uh, she'll talk about another opportunity next Tuesday. To so the outreach opportunities, that's been uh, an interesting thing for the last few quarters, getting enough hours for students. So now I've, I've kind of created a solid list of opportunities that you can find, and it is now online. So in addition to me advertising them here and me advertising them via email, you can find those all online. And I'll try to update those as often as I can. Uh, but two new additions for opportunities, uh, students contacting me regarding Project Chant, which has had previous dental student involvement, but is looking for more dental student involvement. And they focus on providing multidisciplinary disciplinary, student-led interactive education sessions about health topics for groups of patients at Harborview's Jefferson Terrace Respite Program. Um, it provides recuperative care for homeless men and women who are too sick for the streets or shelters, but not sick enough to be admitted to hospitals. Um, so they're looking for dental student volunteers, and they may have a speaker coming to give an intro at one of these discussion sessions. Another project is the Street Medicine Project uh, that just started kind of out of the university, just a conversation on homelessness. Uh, it's mirrored after the Street Medicine Detroit program, and they're in their initial phases of the project. They just completed a, a needs assessment on the community, and it was very thorough and comprehensive. So they'll be meeting soon to kind of develop what the what they want their program to look like. And actually, I want to um, uh, put up uh, on your radar that uh, Dr. Koba and I just talked to Dr. Um, oh, I can't remember his name now. Uh, he's a physician in allergy and uh, infectious disease, I think. And he is a medical director or advisor for the Rotacare Clinic that is a student-led, uh, medical student-led clinic. And we've been talking about it for a while, the dental involvement. They've wanted it, and it's just getting closer now. They, there's a long history to it, but basically it's going to be in alliance with the Medical Teams International van. But they're trying to see if they can use some of uh, Seattle King County facilities that are up there for um, you know, the community clinic. And so they really want to be interactive and have medical students, you know, be escorting patients. I mean, you know, having with interacting with the dental students, even though we'll be delivering care in a van. So that's our. We do have affiliation agreement already with uh, um, Medical Teams International. So that may be sooner than we think. You know, one of the, although it's already been three years in the making, but it's going to be. It's closer on the horizon than it's been before. So maybe by next quarter. Even. So we'll keep you posted on that. Um, 
if you participate in any outreach so far, uh, be sure to track your hours. You can find the tracking link on the website, tinyurl.com forward slash health and mm -hmm. um, I just secured the last speaker for this quarter. So after today, we'll have three left uh, for this quarter. Uh, the last speaker will be George Sidwell, who is part of the Real Changes uh, Homeless Speakers Bureau. So he actually is a real change vendor and has had experiences with uh, his health that have led him to homeless, homelessness and out of homelessness. So it should be a, a pretty good story. You can uh, read his profile on their website as well. Um, don't forget to sign in and complete the surveys and just sign in for yourself if your friends eating lunch next door. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce Nancy Amade. Uh, from 1992 to 2008, Nancy Amade was on the faculty of the University of Washington School of Social Work. Today, she continues to direct the Civic Engagement Project, which works with nonprofit organizations throughout the country. CEP offers advocacy training, speeches, workshops, and resource materials for work at federal, state, or local levels. A writer, teacher, and advocate, Ms. Amade has been involved in social policy from both inside and outside government. She is a former director of the Food Research and Action Center, a national anti hunger group. She also served in the Carter administration as a Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Federal Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, which is now known as DHHS. And in the early 70s, she was on the staff of the U.S. Senate Committee on Nutrition and Human Needs. For many years, she wrote a weekly email bulletin that described the Washington State legislative process, focused chiefly on health, human services, and civil rights issues. Policy Watch helped readers understand what happens as the legislative session of among her writings are a guide to policy advocacy called So You Want to Make a Difference, which she probably has. Okay. We'll, we'll okay. She probably has that. Uh, and a play called How Miss Bill Became a Law. During the 1980s, she wrote a weekly column that appeared in newspapers around the country and did commentaries for NPR's All Things Considered. Activities include co authorship of a legislative simulation, co authorship of a curriculum for an annual three day advocacy camp and service on a variety of national, local, nonprofit um, agency boards. I've been involved with her in the uh, UGIS Conversation on Homelessness, the Health Science and Service Learning Group, and various other meetings. Uh, let's welcome Nancy Ahmed. Thank you. Yeah. You'll notice that my resume gets longer and longer because I'm getting older. Um, <laughs> People who have very long resumes at very young ages, I think you should be suspicious of. <laughs> anyway, this is, this is the advocacy guide, so you want to make a difference. And I am going to take my time mostly not to talk about homelessness, because I think you are hearing a lot about homeless people and different issues. I'm going to focus a little bit more on what's going on down in Olympia and what you can do when you're down there on your lobby day. That's okay. But feel free. I'll Then we don't worry. Okay. Um, okay. Anyway, I guess I'll hold it. Are all of you who are in this room today going to lobby day? Mm -hmm. Pretty much all of you. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks. So I'm going to start off with a couple of things. I've got three things on my list. One, well, I just want to say a few words about the U District Conversation on Homelessness. And then I'll talk a little bit about lobby days and about the legislature in specific because you're going to lobby day and I want you to kind of have a mindset for being around all the elected officials and their staff. Then I'm going to give you five easy ways to be advocates. Whether it's at lobby day or all through the year, there are easy, easy ways that in five minutes or less, won't, you'll be able to do it even though you're a student. Honest, true. And if I have a few minutes, I'm going to give you a quiz. Oh, and I brought along a little outline that you can use for getting ready for your visits down in Olympia. So, I brought that along as well. And I am going to try and put this around my neck or something so that I don't have to hold on to it. I'm Italian. Okay, is that going to work? Mm -hmm. If I choke, there's somebody medical in the room, right? <laughs> okay, this is, this is going to have to do it. Okay, I want to start off with just a couple of words about our industry conversation on homelessness. So we started five years ago, and we say we draw from five sectors. So we draw from the UW, some faculty, some students, some retirees, 
We also draw from direct service providers in the university area. So people who put on meals, who run shelters, who do all that sort of stuff. We draw from faith communities. They tend to be very active in helping homeless people and are an important part of our group. From the broader community, which is to say sometimes people show up who are part of resident associations or part of the business community or whatever. Mostly those people are on our email list because if they're working during the day or have businesses during the day, they can't come to the meetings on Monday morning. And then we have people who are or have been homeless. So it draws from those five sectors. We meet monthly on the second Monday of every month. We meet from 9 to 11.30. The first part is usually something to teach us something. We'll have speakers or a panel or something like that. After a break, then go into action group. And in fact, at our meeting in December, one of the things that we did, we had people come from city council, county council, these are staff people, and somebody from the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance. And among the things they were telling us, they were talking a little bit about the extra shelter that had opened up downtown and around King County. And just in case anybody has not heard, the King County Administration Building, which last year opened up for 100 men at night when it was cold, did not this year. So you might want to send a little message to your county council member and or to the county sec about that point. Why not? It's cold this year. Uh, but as they, after they left, and we went into our action group discussions, somebody said, well, what about the U District? Do we have any overflow shelter? Are we doing anything special on cold nights? Both. Sad answer was no. So we talked about it, and we voted to ask the School of Social Work, which is right down from where we meet, um, to serve as an overflow shelter for homeless youth from roofs. And I trust that you've all heard of Roots by now, for young adults, 18 to 25 year olds. So they are now considering that as a possibility. And we're having ongoing conversations about it, and, and we just may have an overflow shelter for young adults in the U District if those conversations continue. But you all might also want to think about whether or not there are any other buildings that you know that are close to the app, convenient to the app, that might serve as overflow shelters. Or for those of you who go on the one night count, one of the things you're going to be noticing, I trust, is that there are a lot of people these days living in their cars. Should the university open up its parking lots? Should it open up its parking garages to homeless people who live in their cars? If so, on what terms? Who would monitor? What else would you provide? Well, it's worth thinking about. Because at one point, many years ago, when I first moved out here and I was brand new at the UW, and I was sitting in my shared office, this little cubicle over at the School of Social Work, I got a call from my dean. I was brand new, and the dean's calling me. And she said, I'm so glad you're there. Um, I just had a long conversation with a woman from the church council, and I'd like you to hear her out and see if there's anything you can do for her. Can I send her down? So of course I said, yes. Right, that's my dean, right? Okay. And moments later, a stocky little lady came charging in. She said, I'm at the church council, and I work on homelessness, and I just want you to know, you're at the UW. You are the biggest neighbor in the neighborhood, and you aren't even involved, and you people ought to be ashamed. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to Josephine. <laughs> this was a woman who has since died, Josephine Archuleta. She was a powerful advocate for low-income people. And out of that grew any number of projects, including one that I ran for a long time called the U District University Partnership for Youth. And it was how I got to know a lot of the young people who were living on the ad at the time. And we did a variety of things, including we opened our building, which had two showers in the basement. We opened the showers for the youth um, twice a week, which startled a lot of people. <laughs> but we had to go through a big process. This is the university, right? We had to go through committees. We had to be cleared by all kinds of things. And then we had to have so much equipment on hand. We had to have syringes, and we had to have big, um, clean disposal units, and we had to have all, they said we had to clean the showers. We had to disinfect them after every shower. And we had to have all kinds of soap, and we had to have all kinds of detergent and all kinds of equipment. So here's all this equipment. And the very first day that we were open, one 16-year-old shows up, and his 
he takes his shower and there's all this stuff around and there are all these people rushing around to say, can I help you, can I help you on the volunteers, is there anything you need? Can I help you? <laughs> Finally, he's sitting on the stairs and I walk up to him and I say, so, how was your shower? <laughs> this kid looks at me with his glasses dripping with water and he said, quite honestly, it's a little overwhelming. <laughs> and I realized, oh, we got to back off a little bit. Anyway, so think about ways that you could be involved. Think about very practical ways that you could be of help. Uh, sometimes the best thing we can do is treat people with a little bit of respect and dignity and acknowledge the humanity. That was a point that came across loud and clear last night at the panel on the, the uh, common book. And it was very good to hear again. Okay, so that's what I'm going to say about homelessness. Feel free to ask questions later if you like, but I want to get into the business of you as advocates. So how many of you know who your state senator and two representatives are? So would you please look around this room? You're in a room full of overeducated people, and I don't see a single hand. <laughs> okay, you need to know that. That's a very basic piece of you as citizens and of what you should be feeling responsible for. Um, can I assume you know who the President of the United States is? <laughs> okay, that's reassuring. And you know who our two U.S. Senators are? <coughs> who are our two U.S. Senators? Patty Murray. Senator Patty Murray is? Senator Campbell. Senator Maria Campbell. Yes. Until Mr. Hensley was elected last year, we were one of only four states that had a woman governor and two women senators. So it's a pretty small club. Um, okay, so you don't know who your people are, but I'm going to give you an easy way to find out before long. And I want you to kind of humor me. I am going to use this little piece of the board. I kind of like you to see a few numbers. Because one of the things that you should keep in mind when you head to Olympia is that people in Olympia think in terms of numbers. It's very much on their minds, consciously and unconsciously. So, we have 49 legislative districts in our state, across the state. <coughs> and as you just heard, I reminded you that we have one senator and two representatives. So, how many senators do we have in the state senate? Okay, this is not a trick question. We have 49 legislative districts. Each district gets one senator. How many do we have? Are we allowed to send people back to second grade? <laughs> Maybe not. Okay. So, and we have two representatives at the state level for every district. So how many people are in the House of Representatives in our state? 98. Okay. Now, the numbers that the people around Olympia keep in mind are those, of course, but they also keep in mind what's known as capital map, and it looks like this. Twenty-five plus fifty plus one plus one, and that stands for what it takes to win. Because you normally don't need all of these to vote in your favor. You don't even need, except in rare occasions, you don't even need a supermajority in the state. What you need is a simple majority, which means that for anything to pass, you need 25 votes in the Senate, you need 50 votes in the House, and after something passes the Senate and the House, who gets to say yes or no? The governor. That's the Senate. And this is you and me, because we can influence all of the above. That's what it takes to win in Washington. 25 plus 50 plus 1 plus 1. And I can assure you that every legislator down in Olympia and every lobbyist in Olympia, they know the capital map. And they're constantly counting votes. And it also applies to committees. So if you've got a bill, last year there was a bill to help relieve um, um, uh, dental students, in fact. Um, it was had to do with how you could pay off loans and things like that and make it easier, and it also had something to do with scholarships. So that went immediately, when a bill is referred, it goes to a policy committee immediately, that went to the higher ed committee. And the higher ed committee had to discuss it and debate it. They got a chance to amend it. 
They had to vote on every, amended, every amendment, and then they had to vote on the bill as amended. It got really good, strong votes. Then it went out to the House, and the House went through the same process. They sent it to a committee, the Higher Ed Committee, and they discussed it and debated it and amended it. And then there were some changes between the House and Senate, so they had to send the House version back to the Senate. The Senate accepted the House versions, and by the end of the year, the governor signed it into law. But every time, you want to keep your eye on, so how many votes is it going to take to win? With most of your issues, you're going to be going before the health care or health care and wellness committee in the House, as it's called. This one has 16 members. This one has 11. So how many votes do you need to win in this committee? I can hear it. And how many does it take to win in this committee? So one of the things you want to do, if you care about a bill that's before that committee, then you want to look up who the members are. Do you have anybody on that committee, anybody in your group who has a member on that committee? That's going to be important. Anybody in your group who has sits in the district of the chair? Does anybody know if Eileen Cody is a name you recognize? She chairs the House Health Care and Wellness Committee. She's a nurse at group health when she's not in session. If you live in her district, you've got the chair of the House Health Care and Wellness Committee as the person that's going to be listening to your messages. That's power. And you want to see, do you know people in at least half of the districts that are represented on those key committees? And then the next thing you want to do is you want to figure out how you could get to a bunch of those people and get them to get to their legislators. Which isn't hard. And I'm going to teach you how just a little bit. Okay, so all the way through, you want to be thinking in terms of these numbers. And you want to be thinking in terms of numbers because you know that other people are thinking in terms of numbers, namely the people that you have to influence. So that's just really basic stuff. Um, one other quick little number that I want to or a set of numbers that I want to offer you has to do with the fact that I frequently get asked by, not just by students, but by all kinds of people, so how many calls or letters does it take to have an influence? How many emails do you have to you know, generate? So I always ask legislators, and you should ask your own legislators what's most effective with them. But last, two weeks ago, I was over at Eastern Washington U, and the students in Cheney had just organized a big rally on behalf of the Washington Cream Act, which you've probably heard about, for immigrants who were brought here as little tiny babies. They might be undocumented, but they grew up in the United States. All they've known is the United States. So now the idea is they should be able to go to school at local rates, just like any other resident in the state. They shouldn't have to pay out of state, and they should be treated like people who've grown up here. They've grown up here. So the students over in Cheney organized a huge rally, and a number of legislators were invited and showed up when they heard how big the student crowd was going to be. Two of those legislators came into the classes where I was speaking that day. And each time, the students asked them about, you know, so how much does it take to get your attention? So interestingly, the fellow, one of the fellows is somebody who's retired from Microsoft. And the first thing he said, which I think startled all of us, was, like, quite honestly, I really hate the emails. I said, I'm so sick of emails. I spent so much of my life on emails. I don't like to go through the emails. I ask my staff to go through those, and I help design a, an answer, but yeah, personally, I don't like to deal with emails. This is a Microsoft guy. Okay, anyway. Um, the other fellow, oh, but he said, anything that's personal is more likely to get my attention. And he said, he didn't like the emails, but he really likes the calls. So he makes sure, even though he's not in the office much, he gets a list of the calls that came in from people in his district. And he tries to personally re respond to as many of those as he possibly can. Nice. So you ask your guy, how do they like it? What do they like to get it in? The other fellow was very nice, young man. Uh, he's got two small children. Very nice fellow. And he said, you know, I can tell you one thing off the top of my head. The robo letters don't impress me. I mean, I'm, I, yeah, of course I pay attention. You know, if 
200 people have signed a letter. Sure, I pay attention. But he said, I know that if all you have to do is just click your name. It might be because your friends were standing behind you saying, come on, you got to click on it. Come on, you ought to add your name. Come on, how come you haven't signed? He said, it doesn't tell me whether or not there's any real feeling behind it. But if it's personalized, that's a different matter. Anything that's got anything personal, that will get my attention. And he said, and it doesn't take many. He said, like, seven. And more than once in the time that he was with us, he said, you know, seven emails, seven calls or letters. Hmm. He just that number more than once. Seven. I've heard other legislators say, I don't know, 10 or 12, 10 or 15, about a dozen. So the question I like to ask people is, so how many of you know a dozen people with access to a telephone? More fraud. Of course you do. You all do. Yeah. So just think, if there's something you feel strongly about, like the Housing Trust Fund that's going to help keep homeless people housed, or the Housing and Essential Needs Program that helps give a little tiny bit of really essential needs, like <coughs> sanitation products and stuff like that, and a little bit of cash for adult homeless people. Little tiny stuff. You could send a message about that. You generate a dozen calls or letters or emails on that subject, it's going to get attention. Chances are it'll get noticed. Now, one guy said, look, it's not going to buy my vote. Ten calls, not going to buy my vote. He said, but it will rent my attention. OK, they're dealing with about 2,000 to 2,500 bills in a typical year. So if you can get their attention focused on one out of that 2,500, that's worth something. And if you can do it with a dozen calls or emails, that's worth doing. Personal. Even if it starts off with a message from somebody else and you just personalize it yourself. That's, that's easy. Oh, and one other little thing, also a number. This year, they will only meet for 60 days. Next year, they meet for 105. We are a part-time legislature. This is not a full-time legislature. And they are going through thousands of bills in a very short period of time. So keep that in mind. And keep in mind that the only bill they must pass is a balanced budget. This year, the governor has proposed to fully fund, fully restore, adult dental in the Medicaid program in our state. The Senate, in order to do that, I even copied down the numbers, um, I think it's $23.8 million he put into his budget extra for adult dental. The Senate has already said that they will not put in more than $9.75 million, and it would just be for adult preventive and dentures, so a much narrower well, if you want to speak up on that, generate some calls, generate some emails, get some people to send a quick little note. You don't even have to have all the details. You can go to the Washington State Dental Association like I did, and you'll see a little article about it. You can get enough out of there to just, you know, find something that you can send off very, very quickly. It does not take a lot of time, but it could make a lot of difference for a lot of people. And by the way, the Senate is also saying that they think they may not have to pass the budget this year, which has a lot of people surprised. But if they don't work on a budget, there's no way to talk about restoring that money for adult dental under Medicaid. Okay, so should I close off the numbers about the legislature? Feeling not very pumped up. Okay, I'm going to try. I'll keep trying. I'll keep trying. And keep in mind, more than you are, so you have to take pity on them. Okay. So, I'm going to give you five easy ways to be advocates, whether it is right now or later. Whether it is any time in your lifetime. And the first thing you have to do is you have to get yourself signed up with an advocacy group that is following the issues you care most about and get yourself on their email list. Because they are tracking what's happening day by day and week by week. So whether your issues are local, state, or federal, there are advocacy groups
that are following the issues you would care about. I have a list that I call my useful information list of advocacy groups on all kinds of health and human services and, and civil rights and civil liberties issues. And there are gazillions of them. My list isn't even comprehensive. But anybody can find one. You can ask other people. You can Google around. You can ask me. I can send David my useful information list. You can ask around. Get yourself signed up on a good list. If you want, for purposes of the dental stuff, go to the WSDA. That's one place. But there probably are other places as well. It is not hard. <coughs> Get yourself signed up. <coughs> Easy. Second thing, you want to introduce yourself to your elected officials. You should just send them a quick email, and it is easy, easy to do because we have a website that is very user-friendly. It is www.ledgeleg.wa.gov. Easy. And up in the left-hand corner, it says, Find Your District. You click on that, you put in your address, and your senator and two representatives pop up complete with their contact information, and if you like, you can get the names of their staff, and you can find out what committees they sit on, and you can find out all kinds of things. You can find a bio, you can find out what they look like, you can find out if they have hair. You can find out all kinds of stuff about them. So just go to www.ledge.wa.gov, click on Find Your District, and you'll see your people. And then send them a quick email and say, Hi, I live in your district. I care about X. I look forward to working with you on this. That's a good starting message. Introduce yourself in some way, shape, or form. And if you like, you could do all three of them at once. You could do it in a blind CC if you like, or you can put them all up there. You can put them all up there, and then, because of capital math, we need 25 plus 50 plus 1, CC the governor. Throw in the governor for free. It's smart politics. It's good for capital math. And it means that the issues as they come into the governor's office are being filtered to his policy people in the different issue areas, and they will be keeping track all through the process. So do that. Easy piece of cake. Third thing I want you to do, and this is where those of you who have been here before and have heard me before, you know what's coming now. And this is going to be hard because you're spread out all over the place. But I brought you all cell phones. So I have a cell phone. <laughs> Take one. and. Whoa, pass it along. We're well, going to have to get up and get it. Okay. Um, have a cell phone. I have a cell phone for you. Okay. Have one and pass it along. And just keep passing them on up. You are all getting free cell phones. Did you have a cell phone? Or did you give you one? Oh my gosh. I don't want to give you one. Just because you were nice enough to sit. Okay. So look at this. You need a cell phone? Everybody getting a cell phone? And then more. Do you have a cell phone up there? I have some more. Can you come toss these back? Get them up there? Or are they getting them? They're getting them. Oh, good. Everybody's got them. Okay. Okay, so I want you to look at this little cell phone. By the way, you did not know you were getting a free cell phone when you came in here. You got a free cell phone. How good is that? Okay. Look at that number and look at the hours of operation. This is the toll free line for the capital. And it is open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. on weekdays. It's open from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Saturdays, all during the session. And they have language translation. And they have TTY for people with hearing difficulties. And they are the nicest operators in the world. And they are patient. And they will help you. And I can promise you that because one Saturday, a couple years ago, I was calling and I got stuck on hold. It was on a Saturday and they had a lot of calls. And I went on about my business and I was doing other stuff on my computer. And then this chirpy little voice says, State Capital, how can I help you? And I had completely forgotten why I called. <laughs> and I'm fumbling around, and the operator thought I was nervous, and she said, Is this your first time, dear? <laughs> I lied because I needed time to figure out why I called. And she said, and I said, Yes. And she said, Don't worry, honey, I can help you. So do you know who your legislators are? And I lied again, and I said, No. She <laughs> Don't worry, I can help you. I'm still buying time. So, so she, she looks them up, right? She goes to find your district. She puts in my thing. And then the name, the picture of my senator or two representatives pops up. And she said, oh, honey, you've got nice ones. OK, I took that the right way. And so then by that time, I had remembered. And she said, so what's the issue? 
And I said, um, oh, right. Uh, and I told her. And she said, we've been getting a lot of calls about that. Since it's your first time, how about I'll read you one from somebody who's opposed, and I'll read you one from somebody who's in favor. You tell me which one you're most comfortable with, and we'll work out a message for you. Oh, cool. And by the way, I do this with people all the time, and I might want to be given an assignment. I'm going to give an assignment. Use the phone, leave a message, and the next time you get together, report back on your experience. And then, teach other people. You can do it while it's on speaker. Let somebody else hear how easy it is and how non-intimidating. <coughs> Let somebody else find out that they, too, can send a message. And chances are good you're going to get an email back. You're going to get some kind of a message. So this is great, and it's free, and it is easy, and it doesn't take much time. Fourth, you've got to be in the practice of having no pride. Um, well, okay, there's probably a better way to say that, but you've got to be willing to advertise your issue, especially when you go down to Olympia. You are going to have those gorgeous shawls, I guess, again, that advertise who you are. Or are you allowed to wear white coats? Do dentists wear white coats? They do frequently, right? Maybe you should all go down in white coats. Um, I think the health equity circle is going to. They did last year. Everybody noticed them. They were asking them all kinds of medical questions. It was great. But, and they might, you know, you could offer to look in somebody's mouth. <laughs> I'm not sure that's exactly what you want to be spending your time doing. But, um, but there's another way to advertise your issue. So would one of you quickly, in two words, tell me something that you care about that you'd like to bring up when you're in Olympia? Yes. Uh, I want to make sure that corporations, oh, in two words. The corporations what? Pay taxes? No, don't buy private dental practices. Ah, is there a short way to say that? Let them sell their taxes. Say it again. What is this? On its practice, uh, oh. it very much. We'll, we'll try it that Only way. Only dentists no. own practices. Or no corporate dentistry. There we go. Yeah, I got it. Okay, you just gave me the clue. going to be priority issues when you're down there. Make enough copies so that you can drop one in your senator's office, your two representative's office, the governor's office, and bring a few extra in case anybody asks you about these beautiful shawls you're wearing, and who are you, and what are you down here for. People do that. And then put them in your in a cheapy little folder. And as you are walking around, just happen to clutch your folder to your chest. Mm -hmm. In fact, as you are walking around the rooms, or if you're sitting in a hearing room, listening to a hearing, there's going to be a hearing on dental practices in tribal areas at 1.30 the day that you're down there. You can go sit in on that, and you can just sit in your seat like this. You're not allowed to carry a picket sign, but this isn't a picket sign. Actually, there's one guard in the Cherbourg building who thinks that I'm carrying a picket sign, and he tells me, you know, you're not allowed to have picket signs in here. And I say, oh, excuse me, I forgot. And I put it down until I get past him. <laughs> yeah. You know, you can walk up to total strangers and you can say things like, gosh, have you ever been down here before? <laughs> Your first time, huh? Isn't it a great place? I really like it. And I don't know about you, but isn't that dome gorgeous? Oh, yeah. yeah, beautiful, huh? The buildings around here. <laughs> and you know the other thing I've noticed? People are so friendly. They just... They just walk right up to you, they start conversations and everything. Have you noticed that? Yeah. And I don't know if you've been aware of this, but sometimes these hearing rooms, they get so crowded, it's just really, really warm uh -huh. in here. Yeah. So did anybody miss the message? No. And by the way, you just saw an illustration of what advocacy is all about. It's the two-word definition I like best is speaking up. And you were the one that spoke up, and so your issue is the one that got created around the room. It can sometimes be that simple. I often urge people to make up a sign for themselves. I did something with the public health students the other day. People for public health or housing. We sometimes have, we make a little house 
and put it on. It's easy. Okay, and the last, please, as advocates for your issues, for people who are homeless, for people who need dental care. By the way, homeless people tell me that the need for dental care is huge. That everybody they know has bad teeth and it's really hard to get care. So please put that on your list. But everywhere you go, talk about it. You're in the grocery store line. You think you're getting the fast lane because you got to get out of there fast because you got to get back, right? And instead, that woman up there, she's got to be price checked and you're stuck in your line. And you're thinking, dang, I should have gotten that on another line. Don't think that. Think, I would get the opportunity and turn to somebody on another line and say, hey, you look familiar. Hi. Uh, me? Yeah. Hey, did you hear what they're talking about doing down in Olympia? Uh, no. Well, let me tell you. So what's he going to do? He's trapped. He can't <laughs> hand in his basket. Everybody in his line is trapped. Everybody in the is trapped. He just keeps going until he gives up, right? It's perfect advocacy opportunity. Um, a former student of mine once got on the bus in the U District. She, it was right after we had talked about this. She said, it looked like pretty much everybody was from the U and it was while they were talking about um, raising student tuitions at all the state colleges and universities. She said, so I looked around and I said, hmm, Nancy said, use every opportunity. So I pretended my cell phone was vibrating. I said, yeah? Oh yeah, the reason I called? Yeah, I don't know if you know this, but down in Olympia, they're talking about raising student tuitions at all the state colleges and universities. She raised her voice a little bit. So people up and down the phone, bus are perking up. I said, yeah, no, no, it's not too late. No. No, no, there's a toll-free line. No, you don't have to go get a pencil. Hold on, I'll just repeat it. She said she repeated the number four times. <laughs> People up and down the bus are punching it into their phones, they're jotting it down. Okay. She kept going on and on about this business of what was going on in Olympia, and then all of a sudden she said, I looked up and thought, oh, my stuff, gotta go, bye. Nobody knew there was nobody on the other end of the phone, and she said, luckily it was turned off. <laughs> so, the small point is, you can be an advocate anywhere, anytime, you just have to talk. So those are my five easy, easy things to do. Keep it in mind when you're down in Olympia. Keep it in mind before you go to Olympia, but please, please, please introduce yourself to your legislators, find out who they are, and tell them what you care about. That's the most important stuff. Time to stop. Okay. Don't forget to sign in, guys, and turn in the survey and